It's early morning and cities across the Malay Peninsula come awake. As sunlight reflects off gleaming glass facades, Singapore and Malaysia get ready to begin a new day. Shutters open, the blinds are rolled up, and the early morning news is poured over. Others begin their day with prayers. Like their forefathers who came from India, they worship at mosques and temples. And although in a different country, many thousands of miles away from their motherland, the mantras and chants, the bells and the incense sticks keep alive ancient rituals that came from India. The history of the Indian diaspora in Malaysia and Singapore is long and sometimes tumultuous. Indians have come here over the last millennia and continue to come even today. From all parts of India, they migrate, but most notably from the south. They have come as traders, as merchants, as laborers and convicts. They have come in large groups, herded together in coolie ships or as individuals with valid work permits. Today, multiple strands of Indian culture and color shimmer in the tapestry of Southeast Asia for each community has brought with them their unique traditions, like the Thaipusam festival. In new lands, Indians have kept their identity alive while accepting the best of Chinese and Malay culture. Today, Malaysia and Singapore's Indian communities are a dynamic fusion of the traditional and the modern. Indian influence really dates back thousands of years. We know that Buddhism and Hinduism went from India, came to this part of the world, but even Islam came to Malaysia, to this part of the world, not directly from the Arab world, but from India. India is not a foreign land even to me, because culturally we are exposed to Indian culture. Indian food um, um, has come to Southeast Asia, not just Singapore, um, many, many years ago, and it has influenced many other uh, cuisines as well. The interactions between the uh, various places in Southeast Asia and uh, the Indian subcontinent gave rise to very new ideas of law, new ideas of uh, kingship, new ideas of architecture. Surrounded by dense jungle, the valley of Lemba Bujang kept its secret hidden from prying eyes for hundreds of years. A chance discovery in 1936, however, led to the rewriting of Malayan history. For, concealed amongst the forest litter and covered by the roots of the rainforest trees, was a sprawling complex of Hindu and Buddhist temples and buildings spread over more than 200 square kilometers. Many of these temples date back more than 1,500 years. Artifacts and pottery recovered here and now displayed in the Bujang Valley Museum show clear trade and cultural links to mainland India. The major architectural forms which remain with us today from this classical period in Southeast Asia are all based on Indic models, one would say. Painstaking explorations here, as well as records unearthed in temple and port complexes along the east coast of India, have revealed direct trading links between the South Indian Cholas and Pallava kingdoms and the Malay and Sri Vijaya kingdom. The importance of the Malay Peninsula and Sumatra as the, what might be called the bottleneck in that trade route was recognized very early and the Cholas, when they came to power in um, the 10th century, 
recognized that if they were going to control that trade, they had to control the ports of the Straits of Malacca. These statues of a seated bodhisattva, this dancing girl, Buddhist inscriptions on stones, delicate pottery, all show strong Indian influences. Many Sanskrit words uh, are even now uh, used as root words in the Bahasa Malaysia language. The Prime Minister, for instance, is called Pradhan Mantri. Uh, the word for royal is Raja. Uh, some of the cardinal points, like the North, is Uttara. And it, it might interest you to know that the West in Bhasa Malaysia is Bharat. Like language, Indian culture has become an indelible part of this land. In Singapore's Peranaka Museum, a unique exhibition showcases the ancient connections between India and Southeast Asia through the diverse forms of the Ramayana, a quintessentially Indian epic that has bloomed throughout Southeast Asia. Sita Swamur, Jatayu's valiant efforts are being enacted not by Indians, but by Malays and Singaporeans. We began to uh, put together this idea of a, a Ramayana exhibition, not just telling the epic or the story, but also conveying the concept that actually Ramayana is Pan-Asian. And in the wake of such close cultural links, can trade and industry be far behind? After centuries of looking to the West, Indian corporates today are eastward bound. Southeast Asia, Malaysia will be the new horizon for growth of for Indian companies. And of course for Malaysia, the Indian economy growing at this pace uh, is a very attractive uh, opportunity. And therefore we are just uh, following up on a trade relationship that goes back a long time. Tata Consultancy Services, one of India's leading consultancy and IT firms, has based itself in the Malay Peninsula to provide services to the entire Southeast Asian region. When you bring multinational uh, cultures together, uh, and if you give it an open environment, then you can get a lot of ideas flowing back and forth. India is a natural multinational culture, so we value it. We are focused on local uh, talent. Uh, grown it, uh, hired it, and uh, have them across, whether it is Singapore, Malaysia, or any of our Asia-Pacific countries. Not only have Indian companies come to the Malay Peninsula, Malaysians of Indian descent have become successful entrepreneurs, taking their expertise to the international market and sometimes back to India. The Petronas Tower in Kuala Lumpur is Malaysia's tallest building and its most visible icon. Under the shimmering glass panes that clad its impressive facade is the iron and steel superstructure that holds this building together. And this is the work of the infrastructure company Eversendai, started in 1982 by A.K. Nathan. Yeah, I ventured into construction in 1982 Subsequently, we went on to build a lot of high-rise buildings like the Emirates Towers, uh, the Kingdom Center in Saudi Arabia, and the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building. I'm a Malaysian, but Indian origin. Uh, my roots are still in India, uh, but I'm born and brought up in uh, Malaysia. A.K. Nathan is helping upgrade India's infrastructure as well. His company recently completed the first phase of expansion and upgradation of Mumbai's international airport, its new gateway to the world. And one of the airlines flying into the refurbished Mumbai airport is Air Asia, a leading low-cost airline, also started by a Malaysian of Indian descent, entrepreneur extraordinaire Tony Fernandez, a man most Malays fondly call the Asian Branson. Highlighting these success stories is Shobha Sering Bala, the editor of India Say, a magazine on the achievements and concerns of diaspora Indians. 
I launched my first issue of India Say the magazine. It's called India Say because we are all from India and uh, our tagline is proud to be India Say. Indian excellence in entrepreneurship isn't new to Southeast Asia. Uh, Malaysia's ties with India is not something that happened in the 21st century. Uh, centuries ago, Indian uh, traders, uh, including priests, have been to Southeast Asia and they brought with them goods, your practices, your culture, your language to our shores. Clustered around the town of Malacca are the earliest of Malaysia's Indian emigrants, the Chittis. They are descendants of Indian spice traders who married local Malay and Chinese women, a tradition they still carry on. Their children will be brought up mostly in their mother's culture, learning their mother's language, but the rituals they follow, overseen by their father, will be Indian. Malacca Chitti community is very unique community. Even though you see they are Tamil, they can't speak Tamil. They speak Bahasa. They've been using the Indian influence. N. Natarajan Raja is a local Chitti historian who set up the Malacca Chitti Museum to record the extraordinary journey this tiny community has made over the centuries they lived in Malaysia. Maybe one day I will write a book about this community so that people will know what is this community and where they come. But by no means are the Chittis the only Indians to call Malaysia home. Little India is home to a nondescript building where Dato Palaniapan carries on the trade that brought his family to Malaysia 600 years ago. <laughs> From Chettinad in Tamil Nadu, the Chettiyas introduced their unique systems of transaction and record keeping to Malaya. With an enviable reputation for accuracy, their near perfect bookkeeping increased trust among the Malay and Chinese customers. But not all descendants of ancient Indian traders chose to carry on their ancestral profession. Some, like celebrated chef and author Beni Knight, honor their roots and their adopted homeland by mingling Malaysian and Indian flavors in the delectable dishes tossed together in a magic wok. We used Indian spices. Just now you saw me cooking the vegetable. It's really Indian, right? And I used that punch pora, remember? That's also Indian. But they, they're a little bit different would be the, the beans, right? That is the only thing that will be different. So it's actually, you can't, you can tell, hey, this is Indian food, but it's still a little bit different. Baini's ancestors were soon joined by immigrants from the rest of India, who were brought in by the colonial powers. And the reason for this great migration? Rubber. Smuggled from Brazil and grown under careful conditions in the Kew Gardens, the rubber plant was introduced to Malaya in 1877. And by 1896, Malaya's first plantation had started. Supported and encouraged by the colonial government, large-scale migration of Indian indentured labor took place mainly from southern India. It, re it represented one of the worst aspects of imperialism. You can only again understand it in the context of uh, British imperialism. Here, both Malaya and, and, and India were colonies. Uh, so as far as Whitehall and the London civil servant is concerned, he's just moving uh, people, uh, one colonial people, uh, to, from one island to another. It didn't bother him. Um, and so, yes, it, it was actually very akin to slavery. It, it, the conditions were very, very tough. And in fact, I think they, some of them came in chains. Around 200 miles north of Kuala Lumpur is the small island of Pulau Jerjak. It was here that the laborers arriving from the ports of Madras and Nagapatnam disembarked and were quarantined. Tricked by promises of a better life and stories of unimaginable wealth, the exhausted laborers waited out the days in the quarantine center 
before being taken to the plantations. They were subjected to rather intrusive medical examinations. Uh, once they reached their destination, they were put to grueling labor on the plantations. Huge numbers of people were brought across to work in the plantations, often under very, very difficult situations with uh, great mortality rates and uh, very poor salaries. Descendant of an indentured labourer, Muniapin still works on a plantation, much like his father and grandfather before him. Like Muniapin, Maniam and Devi have also grown up knowing only plantation life. They have been tapping trees together for more than 25 years and understand all too well the difficulties of life on a rubber estate. <laughs> Maniam and Devi, however, are determined that their children will have the option of pursuing another career. They are sent to a local school and their education monitored strictly under Devi's watchful eyes. The Malaysian government has turned their attention to the problems faced by plantation workers' families. New schools have been constructed in many plantations and existing ones upgraded. Many, like El Krishnan, have grabbed this opportunity. In the initial stage, I grew up in a rubber plantation. I took up education very seriously because my parents were very concerned about education. But not all colonial-era Indian emigrants have had the same hard struggle indentured laborers faced. When they talk about the Indians in the past, they always refer to the Indians as laborers. Whereas they, they used to dominate the courts and the hospitals. An eminent Malaysian historian of Chinese descent, Ku Ke Kim, is fascinated by the rich ethnic diversity Malaysia offers. His son, Marvin Ku, also shares his father's fascination for India, becoming a renowned Bharatanatyam dancer and a professor of dance at Malta University. My younger son became very interested in Bharatanatyam. Later on, to ensure that he continued to be very good, I put him under a guru in India. And the guru one day told me, he said, every 